we got Jimmy James Allegria. <laughs> and Eric, I don't like to say his, his uh, nickname on camera, Sorensen. Okay, <laughs> so we'll just jump right into this. Uh, I want to start with Eric first. Let's talk about sort of the beginning. You were in sports, you were in action sports, and then sort of like, Basically, how did you get started into the original career that you had, which was an action sports business? Um, hello, everyone. Thank you, Jason, for having me. Um, You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, how it all started was uh, I became a pro surfer at about the age of 17, um, followed up the, through skateboarding um, and snowboarding as well. So I lived in uh, San Diego, California. So very easy to cross over, cross over into the other athletes or other sports. Um, I was living in Carlsbad at the time, and um, at that time it was like a mecca yeah. of action sports. Um, From you know, San Clemente to Carlsbad, basically. San Clemente yeah. to Carlsbad, you had like, uh, you know, surfing-wise back then was like Rob Machado and Trevor Chris. Um, skateboarding was like Danny Way to uh, Jamie Thomas. Um, you know, many others, uh, snowboarding, you had like Todd Richards and, and some other who are all, uh, icons of the sport. Um, and I had, I was just fortunate to grow up with them. And, and a lot of the brands kind of exploded during that same time. Yeah. Correct? So they were also entrepreneurs. So being in that position of riding with some of the greatest athletes of, of our time and them being my friends, I got to also watch, you know, Ken Block, uh, drawers. DC shoes, XYZ, all kind of, you know, zero skateboards, planet Earth, all, you know, evolve. Um, and some of those brands today are, are, you know, icons of the action sports industry. Um, I didn't know it at the time, but um, I was just a young kid who just really wanted to travel the world and be an athlete. Um, and as time started progressing um, and I started watching it, I was actually, you know, interning at a, as a sense and um, really just watching what those guys were doing and how they, they created business. That's a key takeaway that I had last week. Uh, I worked for free for two years. That's kind of how I got my start. But you were sort of either getting paid or not. But when you got into actually getting a job, which was probably a shoe company, right? Um, well, it depends. Led into that? It depends. Back then, um, you know, I dropped out of high school at 14. I don't recommend that. Um, but for me, it was just like I was chasing – I was walking home from school one day and I was like, okay, one day I'm going to say what if. Um, and, I, and I was like, I had two what ifs at that point. Like, what if I were to go to school and, you know, get graduate and go to college and, you know, graduate and find a job? Or what if I were to just leave right now, surf every day and chase my dreams and travel the world? Um, back then, surfing wasn't a real job, even if you were getting paid. And uh, by the time I got home... Um, I didn't want to do my homework that night. I wanted to go skateboarding. So I decided to say, what if I went to school? And um, that's, the pro that's the path I chose. And that path led you into a pretty so fantastic that journey. That, that path yeah. about, you know, that was, a, that was at 14 or 15, and I got my first check for uh, surfing at about 17. So as a professional, you're getting paid, and I had a job, and I was getting a monthly check. So I, I would sit with other people didn't say, hey, when are you going to get a real job? But any job that pays money, to me, I consider real. Right. So then how did that lead up to working for a company? Um, or led, that led to leading up to a company, but... Yeah, so that just kind of being around in the industry and um, not only around the athletes and, and competing, it just put me into the industry and meeting a lot of the guys who were the CEOs, the marketing directors, the CMOs, the CFOs. Um, so I just had relationships. Um, my Rolodex just kept getting bigger and bigger, and all the people that um, I was writing against or um, I was with um, just saw my passion and my drive, my curiosity. Um, I was, in a sense, a trend forecaster at that point. I was always doing things that were ahead of its time. Um, so I just started getting offers. Cool. So what's a misconception that a lot of, because I'm, I'm, I'm getting from you that you worked day and night basically to get where you are. And, I, and you still have that ethic now? Yeah, definitely. But putting CEO and entrepreneur in your Instagram handle nowadays is a little <laughs> different than... Um, or public figure. Yeah, <laughs> that's mine. Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'm just driven. I, like um, the, the type of characteristic that I have, like maybe some people call it sleep apnea. But uh, for me, I'm just... 
I'm passionate and creative. And so when I get ideas and things run through my head, I, I get energy. So it's really hard for me to sleep. Um, and one of my mentors today, which came later in, later in life, was just like success over sleep. Um, get yours now while you can, because later on you, you're not going to be able to have that energy. So get after it. Awesome. Okay, let's go over to James for a minute. So, Jimmy James, um, I kind of want to start your journey into where your business started. So okay. how long ago was that? Uh, let's see. So I think the business started on, on two parallel tracks that eventually coincided between me and my partner. Uh, I've been a lifelong, at this point, marijuana advocate. Um, you? Me. It was a after actually the, the place that we're sitting in, uh, which I was a busboy at this location. Um, after that, my first real job was selling marijuana. Um, so I, I came in. Pharmaceutical into salesman, is what you're saying. <laughs> straight illicit street <laughs> selling. Um, at and that you wore Cortez back then, too. Yeah, which I is and I've worn so Cortez since the early 80s. And um, so my journey came um, with, a, with a passion for the product and. Eventually, I crossed paths with um, another individual who had the same passion in a different way, and our dynamic led to the company that we have now. Um, so around 2004, we met, um, combined passion, started thinking about how we could um, just survive in the pre-regulated market, and we were pretty much growing weed and selling it. And then, um, you know, as legalization came on the horizon, um, there was a bill... I think in 2010, a uh, statewide proposition for legalization. So as the murmurs of that stuff started to come about, we felt like we had to form a uh, ancillary business to the industry so that we could profit from the legalization of it and still continue to do what we did. Um, what year was that? That was, so the Proposition 19 was 2010. Around 2008, uh, fourth quarter 2008, we got the idea to um, make a dispensary finding website. <coughs> which is funny because we're now sitting at the table with um, the company that sunk ours. Uh, <laughs> so we, we were quickly outpaced by uh, Ted. Te <laughs> we were quickly out surfed every day, bro. I know. <coughs> so we were quickly outpaced by tech companies that were, um, had actual experience in, in building platforms and, and whatnot. But in promoting our product through conventions, through shows, we found out what our real value was. And that's we knew how to cultivate. And we knew how to cultivate at the highest levels. So we pivoted from a dispensary finding website to a consulting company. And we essentially went and set up grows for other people in the background. It was so that we could do all of our research and development and find out what it takes to go to scale on somebody else's dime before we did it for ourselves. Smart. Which was a lot shorter of a plan than actually came to fruition. We're now building out our cultivation in South Los Angeles 10 years after the inception of our business. But, you know. Well, so jump in. I want to take you back for a minute. So when you say you had partners in 2004, Right? 2004. Are those the same guys you're, or w girls you're with now? or Same same, same individual group? I'm with now. Okay. Did you guys have capital? None. We bootstrapped everything from the beginning. I love it. And yeah. then, so from then to 2010, you're on autopilot kind of. Yeah. <laughs> and because sure. you start hearing sure. rumors in like 2007 and or six? End of, end of that, 2008, right? you started to yeah. hear like the, the war path to legalization in California. So that takes me to this question. Um, <coughs> how did you go through federal, state, and county? Because I'm hearing a little bit here and now still that some weird stuff's happening, but mm -hmm. there was a crazy transformation in the state of California and sure. federally as well. But how did you survive through that whole obstacle process? Uh, with, with a lot of worrying, a lot of, a lot of sleepless nights. Um, a lot of fear for, for my safety physically, uh, a lot of fear for the safety of my family, um, which is why at this point, <clears throat> when we look at capital coming in from outside investors and, and you know, uh, business um, guidance and advisors, we take everything with a grain of salt because they never knew what it was like before that line was drawn. They never knew what it was like to, to fear all of these things, uh, incarceration, you know, anything that goes along with a illicit product and... <coughs> everything that the prohibition wrought against us. Right. So when when did you start seeing, because basically w 
the people that I knew in the business, they didn't even know what was, no one really knew what was going on. So you had a corporation or you had a, right? You, do you have LLC or an S Corp or how we, you? Yeah, we started with, I mean, we're Because people are like, okay, I'm just going to pay mm. the state the $800 a year mm. and pray that nothing goes wrong with whatever I'm doing. Oh, so, so we bounced. Right? We bounced. Okay. California was too much of a shit show. We, okay. we, were, we weren't willing to like play the games in California. Arizona rolled out a very straightforward, very sophisticated medical program. Uh, so we packed up in 2011, went out and did business development for about six months, locked down a client, and we ma have managed a 30,000 square foot indoor facility since 2013 there. After our first crop dropped, like Q2 2014, they became the number one trending dispensary in the country just because we brought like the Cali fire to Arizona and it was an absolute vacuum and we just, yeah, we, we gained a reputation quite quickly. And on the heels of that, we went into the Nevada market. By the time we rounded out Nevada, California actually came with some sort of like comprehensive regulation and we started to make our plan to enter back into our home state. Sweet, cool. <coughs> so how are you marketing at that time? I feel like that was kind of a slippery so slope, in the, in wasn't the, it? In the, in the good old days, you really You don't didn't. want anyone to know who you are, we, right? We used, we used to love to say that you didn't have to advertise or sell marijuana. You simply had to tell people that you had it. And so our quality drove a lot of our sales. Our quality drove our reputation. And we weren't ever really needing to reach outside of our immediate circle uh, or our immediate network or ecosystem to drive sales or to, to drive new contacts. But with scale comes all of the headaches of, you know, having to sell all the product that you can create. Right. And if someone wants to buy in to a business like yours, mm -hmm. what's that look like nowadays? I'm just curious. Uh, it's scary. I mean, we, we've attracted the best liars on earth to our industry. Um, the stories that I've heard, that I've seen sold, that I've seen millions and millions of dollars wasted um, on guys that, like, you know, had I not had any insight, I would believe, you know, very sincere sounding people taking money that's at a way higher risk than they're, that they're laying out. Um, so at this point, you know, th there's a little bit better tools with regulation on how to do diligence on something that you might potentially invest in, um, but still hard at this point. I always thought maybe you have like, you know, like when you buy a house, you have proof of funds. Sure. You should be like, hey, okay, let's see your bank account. Because <laughs> like, yeah. everyone wants to come in for free, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, so are you, you have other projects you're working on too though, right? I do, sure. Yeah. And then are you in, how many like this out, uh, outlets are you in? Or is it like, uh, so obviously is it by state? No. Well, no. In California right now is really where everyone's trying to gain the most traction. This right. is, you know, the largest market in the world. And, you know, anything you can make cool here it will kind of transcend to being cool everywhere. So building brands in California is the goal short term for almost everyone. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're here. We're uh, another company that I work with is the backbone to the largest to consumer um, delivery platform. And then I have another agency where we're looking to build brands in different demographics um, for the cannabis industry. Cool. Um, this brings me back to Eric. Um, Little mic let's switch. talk about marketing now. Mr. Marketing guy. Okay. Uh, you got stuff going on everywhere. You're on airplanes like every day and you're pushing for the last, I don't know, three or four years, weedmaps.com basically, right? And the action sport division. And I think your journey is really interesting because I asked you all those questions before, but you kind of had to start off faith with this company, even though they're like the largest thing since like baked bread right now. But I mean, people call them like the Red Bull of weed basically right but when you started there it wasn't like that in the beginning uh, exactly so um, to answer your question on uh, what the company was like at the beginning when right. I started or what am I doing uh, for well, marketing I think your journey that led you to here you went to somewhere like weed maps and you looked around and you're like oh my god and so at that point how many employees were there okay. you could because you kind of built the program from the ground up from what I saw uh, yes, um, the program didn't exist that when I came into Weed Maps, um, and on the marketing side, um, you know, before I, I was the, 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 the team manager and the creative, con uh, creative director at a shoe company called Osiris, um, and I, I 
I basically created all, all the content there and I built all the teams. From there, I went to uh, Boulevard Supply, um, which was like a, a streetwear line and marketing concepts. I, I learned to really take risks and uh, started getting the, the clothing into um, the, the music um, industry. And then from there, I was like, okay, what am I gonna do next? This is Boulevard Supply. The logo was, uh, was a palm tree, which represented California, but was also like a pot leaf. Um, and I started doing research of- I mean, that, but that brand was, at the time, exploding as well. So we brought that, that brand- Big Tilly's business. So yeah, we brought that. that brand in, and it was the first time Tilly's did an all-store buyout. It became the number one selling brand in Tilly's. Um, it started to take off, and I was like, okay, how do I take it to the next level? Um, I started re doing research and finding out what, what, was, here's, here's what, what was the biggest in the cannabis space, and that's where Weed Maps came along. What I but I, what I want everyone to know is you literally went to a trade show in Saul Boulevard with a camera, and you're like, I'm going to do a video for you, or I'm going to do this for you. So it, I think the takeaway for me is just your audacity and your courage to see an opportunity, and literally you, made, you created your own position there so then we're going up to weed maps and it literally was the same exact thing uh yeah on a bigger scale obviously 100 percent. so yeah. you know on that thank you for that acknowledgement because you know being in a position being young and everybody saying no way you can't do it um you have to do it this way i didn't believe that so um and for me i just i i've just got like dyslexia but i look at things of what people aren't doing, but I focus in on what they're not doing, and then that's where I've always found my niche. I mean, you literally had a video camera, and we're walking around a trade show, and you're like, I'm gonna talk to these guys. That was like uh, seven years ago, I believe. Boulevard. Yeah, 100%. And, it, yeah. and then, and through that, like, <clears throat> you know, I've interned at every company that I've worked for because it's not like, hey, give me a paycheck and I'll do this. Um, I created the opportunity. That's huge, huge advice and a huge testament to you. And so from there, I, just, the table. I said, hey, let me show you what I can do, and, and from there, I've, I've been uh, driven enough, passionate enough, and, and believed enough in the positive mental attitude of, of whatever I conceive and believe I will achieve. So from there, the, determin the determination and the drive um, to, just, to just win. You know, I've just, yeah, I have but I mean, what you did at Weed Maps is pretty phenomenal. So from there, yeah. once I Plus saw... Plus you had a budget. Thank you. No, I didn't. <laughs> Actually, oh, now you do. No, no, I okay. no, I never have actually, um, and that's the thing that people don't know is um, so what I did with Boulevard and Weed Maps when I found out what the biggest thing in, in cannabis was going to be. It wasn't at that point when I came in there. It was something that I saw that I could bring up and build and make it into becoming. Um, so I did a Boulevard Supply uh, Weed Maps collab, um, and that was the first time that they had ever even thought about doing it. Um, and I I I bridged the gap between streetwear fashion, uh, Brooklyn Projects, 420, and infused all the cultures into, as well as the first time bringing it into the mainstream outside of um, yeah. pot leaves and smoking weed, right. Chronic 2001. That, doing that with retail was a huge anchor at Brooklyn Projects. It was the first, time, it was the yeah. first time ever done, um, especially in LA and, and to that boutique style. Right. And you guys did the wall, a huge mural on the wall. Did, yeah. I brought in seventh letter. I rebuilt the ramp. Um, I just infused all cultures. And I wasn't working at Weed Maps at that time. Um, and then from there, uh, they, I just kept working on, on building, uh, you know, bringing artists into Weed Maps, really like building relationships in Weed Maps. Um, and then um, three months later, I got an offer letter and they asked me to uh, come in and build them a small skateboarding team. Um, I said, no problem, but is that, all, is that all you want or is there opportunity for me to grow in this position? And what I saw is the opening to do what came from Weed Maps and Action Sports. So there was no budget. I had a salary. They didn't tell me what they were gonna do with it, but I saw and did the research and studied what Weed Maps was. And that was all the brands that were on there, all the dispensaries that were on there. They were an advertisement platform. And I knew that if I built something that I can also sell it, sell against it. So everything that I built, I, I brought in, you know, OPM, other people's money to sponsor the activation and sponsor the athletes to where, um, you know, weed maps really didn't have to pay anything. I just kept building off of that and building off of that. And, uh, like the you know, Coachella off, house or something well, like the, the pipe house in Hawaii was the right. first one. Right. Um, same thing. I did something different there. And I brought in, like, I filled the pipe house with, with skateboarders. 
and everybody was like, what do you mean? It's pipeline, it's a surf break, why, 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 why skateboarders? Um, it was that thing that nobody had ever done. It was a risk that I wanted to take. Um, I knew that there was going to be plenty of surfing there. Um, so I just brought a different voice. I brought a different attitude and emotion. And from there, after that activation was the first time ever that an activation at, at Pipeline got a, a cover for skateboard, 10-page article in Trans World, uh, cover on Stab, 10-page uh, article. It went, it went viral all over. Um, and from there, that, that's when the conversation saying, hey, is this the next Red Bull? So out the gate... Um, we just went viral and we hit and then from there it was it was keeping up with the momentum yep cool so now that we're in 2019 you've got giant tobacco money coming into the space and, and huge nobody budgets. knows that for sure opinion my opinion is, is that that's what's happening um, what do you think is gonna set people apart or is everyone just gonna get bought I think at the end of the day, it, it, it's like it's like the alcohol industry or it's like the bar industry. Um, you have your Budweiser, you have your Heineken, uh, you, you've got your tequilas. There's still always like imported beer. There's always still going to be that, you know, that homegrown type of cannabis. Um, there's that boutique and certain people are going to want that certain boutique. But uh, right now it's it's the idea and the thought of this being the next billion dollar industry. It's the next green rush not the gold rush um so everybody on the outside is trying to figure out how to grab um and and, and the cultivators and the ogs in the game who understand that um are trying to position themselves to not be taken advantage or push out of the industry that we've created and we fought for for so long um so my opinion is like this the you know the ones who are, are willing to be flexible and, and the ones who are willing to accept the fact that, that this is what's happening and, and corporates coming in, big farmers coming in, potentially tobacco's coming in. Um, how do we market share? How do we work together and take advantage of, of what we never thought would happen in our time? Yeah, exactly. So what does it cost? If someone were going to start something right now, how much do you think it would cost? Like what does a lawyer cost? And what is... To to, to enter the cannabis industry? Just like, hey, I want to do a vape, a vape pen or I want to do a... But it'll, it'll cost you nothing to get out a notebook and start putting down your ideas and start developing those into a I mean, a is this something you could start for free? Like any other... I mean, I mean, a notebook will cost you a buck fifty. Because you can private label a pen. 75 yeah. cents, sure. Right. Yeah. So it's called alibaba.com and yeah. you buy a pen, right? Yeah. Um, what about like... What does it cost to get a, a permit? I mean, you know, like there's... Is it a federal, a state, a county permit? How much does that cost? Is it? So, you know, uh, at, at this point, the barrier to entry is pretty high. Uh, any municipality that's going to give out licensure, there's going to be a line of people uh, that you're competing with. Um, so going out and getting your own license, becoming a, one of the means of production or a, a, a cogger on the supply chain, I don't think is the smartest way to go. There's such scaled operators that, you know, the commodification is, is rapidly happening. Um, so why not add value on with, with a brand, you know? Um, so a lot, of, a lot of people ask me the same question, like, is it too late to come into cannabis? And my first thought is coffee has been a commodity for the last 500 years. If you want to go start a coffee shop, you can, and you can be successful. If you can speak to an audience that you can support, um, and as long as you're not trying to get too big, um, there will always be room for, for craft products, and I think people always appreciate craft products. So... If you want to make a cannabis brand, go make a cannabis brand and find somebody to put whatever goes inside of it in it for you. Perfect. What about you? What's your advice? Uh, my advice is uh, you don't, you know, start on a napkin, go to a, a restaurant at Denny's where you can draw. It costs you nothing. Get with some friends, have fun with your ideas and your thoughts and get started. Um, I don't think, uh, I think, you know, business and entrepreneurs, you know, that, that side of somebody I think it's just in them. So if you're creative and you have somebody else who loves math, like look for the different type of brain, you know, you, in your circle of relationships to so find, find your accountant, you know, one be creative, uh, one who deals with legal and paperwork, um, find somebody different that's, than yourself and, and go after it. Somebody has got to draw an idea. Someone's got to believe in it. And, um, if you are the one with the idea and you believe in it, um, you know, go for it, take a risk, roll the dice. My advice, work for free. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah, 
Um, but what do you think it'll? What do you? Th- what does it cost though? That's kind of my my a mean, ballpark. I, I, um, if you're s- truly serious, there's a poor man's train bark. You can do a fictitious license in a newspaper, which I think is like forty two dollars. Uh, you can mail it to yourself. Uh, an LLC to get out the gate is about eight hundred dollars. Uh, legal fees. So I mean. I think out of, uh, uh, you know, small business can get started legitimately from trademarks, you know, registering, um, getting some tools and some products. You can get out the gate, you know, twelve fifty, you know, to, to five thousand, one to five thousand dollars. You can you can get in the game. Agreed? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Anyone want to ask these guys any questions? I'm going to I'm going to repeat whatever you say. Hi, Alex. The industry is attracted to some of the best liars out there, Alex said. How do you navigate through partners and or hiring? That's a good question. It, it, it's a hard road to travel. Um, I say the industry attracts the best liars because you have no historical data that you can be brought out against. So whatever claims you make that happened or are true, there's no real way to like verify whether that is true or to look at a track record or look at data. Um, it's just as good of a story as you can weave at this point. So with everyone or with anything, it's, it's being able to, to choose the right people and, and believe the right story. And there's a little bit of luck involved in everything, but you know. Um, there's not too much you can do against like a, a well-fanged predator, uh, except for try and power yourself up as best as you can with knowledge and, and, and your own data and make your own, you know, choices and, and whatnot. And again, you get into, you start to scale your business. And even as we scaled our institutional business, we're no longer dealing with people saying they can do what they can't do in the cannabis industry. We're now dealing with accountants who can't do what they say they can do. We're dealing with lawyers who can't do what they say they can do. So when um, Jason asked me about lawyers, it's like, okay, yeah, our first lawyer was charging us $330 an hour. Um, Our next lawyer after that was 500. When we hit about the $800 an hour mark, we started getting real legal advice and real business um, uh, guidance, you know? So while some people could do their job to a certain degree, other people couldn't, and it's all just vetting these things and kind of uh, trial by fire and and learning through um, mistakes and and making those mistakes lessons and, and building upon that and keeping going. Uh, yeah, I definitely think the same. It's it's just basically, you know, taking the recommendations from somebody who's credible. Um, you know, for me, if somebody asked me, like, hey, read this document and tell me if the lawyer's legit, I would go give it to my friend who knows, who deals with it every day. Um, and, you know, for, for me, it's like I stay in my lane. And uh, if, I, if, I, if you're going to ask me a question about creative and marketing and events, um, I know what I'm looking for, and, and that comes with the, the little things in an interview and body language and, and personality um, and, and understanding that, like the behavioral matrix in a sense, knowing who's a promoter, knowing who's a supporter, knowing who's analytical, um, and knowing who's a controller, and, and, and being able to put them in that quadrant to know where they're going to excel. Behavioral matrix, that's amazing. Anyone else? What's up, bud? I can speak to the greater system uh, as it as it lies, and I think you should burn the whole thing down. But the the racist, fear-based prohibition that was laid out against cannabis has de- definitely disproportionately affected people of color. And can we do anything to pay it back? I don't think so. 
you know, and, and do those things happen? Is there people sitting in jail on corners that there's now a dispensary making tons of money? Yeah. Is it okay? No. Do, like, at, for me, I could, I could have profited a lot more financially if it wasn't legalized in, when we passed um, the last round of legalization in California, we all stood to make a lot more money. The, the, the more black market a product is, the higher price it is to produce. Um, we got to a point where our senior advisor, Mel Frank, who's been a long time um, writer for High Times, um, I think he's done some work with Weed Maps. Um, he sat us down and he's an old school guy and he was like, whatever this means, if we lose money, whatever, if somebody can get out of jail a day early, we all fucking support this because no one should be sitting in jail for a plant and especially just because you're a minority. So yes, there is that disparity. Can we fix it? No. Are people trying to adjust it? Yes. In like the most ass backwards way that we possibly could. Um, yeah. But I, I think a lot of more work needs to be done with that. I think a spotlight needs to be shined on that. And um, I'll do everything in my power moving forward to, to keep working for that. Um, at, the, at the detriment of my financial gain, I would much rather see a level playing field for a lot of the disadvantaged communities that were affected by the prohibition. Dude, good answer, bro. Oh my God. A hundred percent. That's a great answer. Uh, on that point right there, like I, I was just, uh, you know, in Texas and in, in, uh, Waco and there's a lot of uh, athletes that came to compete in the new wave pool that's out there. And a lot of the people were like, oh, you work for Weed Maps. Like, what's it like? Like, do a lot of people not work very well or, or are they just stoned all the time? So, you know, due, due to the stigma or race, like, I don't smoke weed. I haven't smoked weed in over 10 years. Um, but that has nothing to do with, with, like, what I used to do and where I came from. But I felt that same type of stigma and racism of just because of what I'm pushing was, like, was the association. And the, the concept was, like, there's a beer sponsor that's sponsoring that contest. But I'm a part of Weed Maps, who's the benefits that come from the extraction out of that plant. And there's so many CBD, CBN, CBG. Um, but they're like, oh, we can't deal with weed. We don't want to market to the kids. And I was like, well, how old are these kids? And they're like, oh, 15, 16. I'm like, well, what is the benefit that comes out of alcohol? And so on that whole, you know, retrospect, it's, it's, it's at the end of the day, well, if you're going to say no to one, which you're saying no to cannabis right now, the hemp, the, uh, the CBD, the health and wellness, um, the recreational of the opportunity of choice, and then you have alcohol, which is okay, and there's not one benefit. And if, if there is, besides checking out, disliberating your thoughts and your brain, th then let me know what that is. And if you can say one to yes, then I believe you should be saying yes to the other. Because you don't have to smoke it anymore. You can rub it on your body. It's edible. Like, and the only bad thing about cannabis at this point is, is the smoke that's being inhaled, in, in my opinion. The efforts that are being fought? Um, and that, and that kind of comes back to what I started that hadn't been done, right? It is... When I came to, we to Weed Maps, I said that, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go after these athletes. And they said, athletes, like, what do you mean? They, they don't smoke weed. And I said, exactly. I want the athletes who don't smoke weed, the ones who are tired of taking Vicodins and pharmaceuticals for, for their medications, um, the ones who not only get prescribed from their injuries, but then they have to fight the addiction to get out of that. When there's cannabis that helps inflammation, um, there's cannabis that, that helps post-traumatic stress disorder. Because a lot of these athletes don't sleep at night because of what they know they have to go into the next day. So what do they have to take? They have to take a sleeping pill. Um, and then the next day they're droggy and, and it becomes an addiction behavior to that pill. Um, so if you can, you know, take a little bit of CBD and relax your mind and, and the inflammation and, and the stress, then at that point the conversation becomes different. Um, so there I started, you know, creating these activations that were around the athletes and the health and wellness and the education. And we started educating the people within the industry as well as the athletes that didn't have to, that didn't understand. And, and then once the conversation has begun, then now look at what CBD is today. And that started from Weed Maps and what we created. That started from signing Bruce Irons, who's one of the greatest surfers of all time, who didn't, doesn't smoke weed at all. And it went from, hey, that doesn't make sense to the average stoner. But we said it's not about getting stoned or getting high. It's about the benefit. 
And that's like that's one of the efforts that I can speak on besides a lot of the movements and and um, people who are out educating and protesting and the movements about you know the 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 people that are in the Midwest who can't get their medication, who have cancer, who are moving to California to to be able to eat and their appetites and the epilepsy. Um, it's at this point I could say just the number one thing is, is educating the people. Any other questions? He's back. Okay. So we had to present ourselves as knowledgeable people. Um, and what we had knowledge around and what we had geeked out on our whole lives was cultivation. So uh, we used that as the base of our narrative. Um, we said, you know, we, we, we would use it as an educational tool of like this, this is what's out there. Our product was how to find these different things at different places. But we approached that by saying in the background we were always cultivating. And this was our, our business to, to reach into the, to the legitimate industry. Um, so... Sorry, I just went off track. What was the question? <laughs> the, what led us to that pivot? Yeah, for sure. So, so in, in putting that narrative out there, um, a lot of the feedback that we would get, convention after convention, was the interest was never in like, oh, that's so cool. Like, how can I find a dispensary faster? Uh, it was, wow, what do you know about cultivation? What do you know about setting these operations up? What are the costs of growing it compared to buying it wholesale? Like, how can this benefit my shop? And with all of that interest, it only took so long before the tech guys got bigger and our need to do something else got greater that we sat down and we were like, hey, well, why don't we just do the thing that everyone's asking us about and the thing that we're best at, and which was a good lesson, like lean into what you're good at and find other people that are good at doing the other things to work with. Good? We good? That's a wrap. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.